just as we introduced average, acceler average velocity, now I'm going to introduce average acceleration. Notice that the velocity changes here throughout time. And that brings me to the next part, the logical part, namely that we're going to introduce an average acceleration. And with a little bit of imagination, you can probably guess what that looks like. The average acceleration between time t1 and time t2 would then be the velocity at time t2 minus the velocity at time t1 divided by t2 minus t1. And the dimension is lengths per second per time squared, so it's meters per second squared. This is then for a one-dimensional situation. This number can be larger than zero, it can be equal to zero, and it can be smaller than zero. In our case, t1 to t2, here, notice the velocity is zero as a start, and it begins to increase because this angle of alpha increases. It's the angle that matters. The angle increases, so in our case, from t1 to t2, the average acceleration is larger than zero. Look at the angle. However, if you take the average acceleration between t1 and t5, that is smaller than zero. Because here, the velocity is zero. But here, the velocity is negative. So if you substitute that in there, you get an average acceleration which is smaller than zero. So the signs in the velocity and the signs in average acceleration depend crucially on how I have defined my increasing value of x, not where I choose my zero point. If I reverse the direction of increasing x, then all my signs will change. So you can also write down then that average acceleration, if you like that, is delta v divided by delta t, but you must be careful because the delta v is sign sensitive. You must obey your sign convention. I have here a tennis ball. And I can bounce this tennis ball. I can throw it down. And let us assume, just for simplicity, that it hits the floor at about five meters per second. And that it's a very, very good tennis ball. And that it also bounces back with a velocity of about five meters per second. I will choose this to be my increasing value of x. And so it hits the floor like this. That means the velocity at which it hits the floor is minus five meters per second. It bounces off, and there it comes, and it goes up with plus five meters per second. I call this v1, and I call this v2. So what now is the average acceleration? Well, I would have to know the time that it takes for this change in direction. In other words, we call that the impact time. I would say in this case, the impact time delta t is probably about a hundredth of a second. And so my average acceleration would be v2 minus v1, that is plus 5 minus minus 5, that is 10, divided by 10 to the minus 2, and that is plus 1,000 meters per second squared. I have, op I have observed carefully the signs. If now I say, aha, I don't like this, I want to call this the value of increasing x. No big deal. This would become a plus, this would become a minus, and then this would become a minus. So then the acceleration is minus 1,000 meters per second square. I have also here a tomato, and I have here some eggs. Now, imagine now that I throw the tomato down, or for that matter, the egg, and that they hit the floor at five meters per second. I could do that. They would not come back up. <laughs> they would go pfft. So therefore, the change in velocity would not be 10, apart from the sign that you have to think about, but it would only be five meters per second. The impact time 
would probably be much longer, maybe a quarter of a second. So therefore, the average acceleration during the impact would then be only five divided by one quarter, would be something like 20 meters per second square. Now, whether you call it plus or whether you call it minus 20 meters per second square depends on your convention of what you call increasing x. But the eggs and the tomatoes don't care what you call minus and what you call plus. Whether the acceleration is minus 20 meters per second square or plus 20 meters per second square, you better believe it, the egg will break. So it's only in your convention that it matters, but of course the physics will not change. The eggs couldn't care less what you have chosen for your sign convention. Something breaks because the magnitude of acceleration becomes too high. That's why something breaks. A few days ago, I saw a Sherlock Holmes movie. And there was a guy who fell on the floor, a marble floor. Hit his head, was lying there motionless. And he was Watson. And Watson said to Sherlock Holmes, what happened? Sherlock Holmes walks over to the guy, touches him, and he says, he crushed his skull. He looked very intelligent, I must say, when he said that. He crushed his skull. And I said, gee, that's really physics in action. It's 801 all the way. <laughs> a modest, a really modest velocity when he hits the floor. But he hit the floor like a billiard ball. The guy was bold for one thing. And so the impact time was very short. And when the impact time is short, even if you hit the floor with a modest speed, the acceleration is high, and that was too much. And so that's why his skull was crushed. So it, what matters is this change in velocity and the impact time. We now want to make one last step from average acceleration. We want to go to the acceleration at any moment in time, just the way we did that with velocity. And that now is a natural step. The acceleration at any moment in time would be the limit for delta t goes to zero, for v measured at t plus delta t minus vt divided by delta t. So that is the instantaneous acceleration. And this you will recognize, is the first derivative of velocity versus time, which is also the second derivative of position versus time. And so here comes the second equation that I really want you to remember forever and ever and ever, that the acceleration is dv dt, which is also d2x dt squared. We can go to our plot and we can ask ourselves the question now, where is the acceleration zero, where is it larger than zero, and where is it smaller than zero, because this value can be larger than zero, equal to zero, and smaller than zero. And now you have to be very careful when you try to derive that from this plot. You have to be very careful, because you and I have no good feeling for second derivative. Velocity is easy. All you have to do is looking at alpha. But when it comes to the second derivative, you have to see how alpha is changing. Well, right here, the velocity is not changing. So the acceleration everywhere here must be zero. Here the velocity is increasing. So the acceleration must be larger than zero here. Here, the velocity is almost constant. It's almost a straight line. What does that mean for the acceleration? Zero. Exactly. Here, when it makes this rounding curve, the velocity is positive here, but on this side it's negative. So what does that mean for the acceleration? Negative. You got it. And so you can now roughly find where the acceleration is positive, where it's negative, and where it is zero. Zero. 